Your attention, please. Paul and Alex are required to proceed to the gate immediately. What? No way. What is happening here? This is the last call for the Layovers podcast. Really? Come on, man. This is our thing. We got this. Oh, yeah. And we made it. Of course, geeks. Flight 84 to Abu Dhabi. I can't believe that we have not covered Abu Dhabi yet. Again, one of these airports I had mentioned many times you could have traveled through, but you went there for the first time lately. I did, yeah. Last week, it's all blurring, and we were just talking before (laughs) we came on air about how how much we've traveled and how every year we say we're going to travel less and we never end up being able to do it. But yes, I did go to Abu Dhabi and yeah, I got to travel on Etihad for the first time as well. So it was a a double first for me. I was sort of not taking notes, but almost, but in ultra high observation mode because it was a new experience (laughs) for me as well. So I wanted to make sure that I, uh, I had my layovers hat on and was uh, making note of things that I perhaps would have already ignored. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so guys, that's why we're doing Abu Dhabi and not uh, as I had into Karachi, or Karachi, Penang, Hamburg, all these airports will come up. We have a huge list, which is great for the holidays because neither of us will be traveling much. Uh, I mean, we still have some travels in December. Uh, We're recording today, December 4th, 2018. But then we have this kind of catalog of of airports. So don't worry, Karachi will come up. But we said, you know, travel with Etihad for the first time. I had traveled it many times this year. You've been to Abu Dhabi for the first time. It's a great way to talk about it. And yeah, surprising. I went through the backlog and I realized that there's so many airports we missed. So there's still some time before we have to come back to airports we've already covered, because I know we have um, actually listeners coming back to us and telling us, oh, what about this airport? And I say, yeah, we covered it. Yeah, okay. We didn't talk about everything because it was sometimes three years ago. Man, it's been so long. <laughs> I cannot believe it. And to your point, the blurriness is actually very potent because sometimes I'm like, so in which airport did I see that again? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh my God. I know it's a privileged thing to be saying. Uh, first, uh, just a story, nothing to do with our travels that somebody had told me, I cannot tell who that is, but she was working for Swissair before it fell down, so like now almost 20 years ago. And <laughs> she mentioned me a story, and I just wanted to mention it because it's, it's almost like something that doesn't happen anymore. She was telling me that in Geneva Airport, Rothschild, the Baron de Rothschild, so, you know, the very famous, uh, very rich person, was taking always the same flight to Paris. 11 a.m. Swiss Air flight from Geneva to Paris. There was a first class, which I'm like, what? When you think about it, that doesn't happen anymore. Mm-hmm. And he loved he absolutely loved hitting the plane. That was one of his favorite things, apparently. So he was always coming early and he was always traveling with his dog. And that's the best part here. Before boarding the plane, which presumably was not done with bridges, but directly with stairs, he would go with his dog around the front wheel of the plane and let the dog pee. <laughs> <laughs> was this a superstition thing or a convenience thing, I wonder? I don't know. Or maybe simply a, a rich person thing. I don't know, but that's mm-hmm. awesome. I love this kind of... That doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't Anyway, happen. I tried to go around the wheel and pee, but that just they <laughs> won't allow me. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll start with a few... Actually, quite a lot of shout outs and reviews and et cetera, because always we try to do our best to acknowledge all the people that have written to us. You all are so kind. Again, we might miss and we are missing many of you. So keep trying. First, a uh, shout out to Kat Hoang. I just want to mention her because she she's doing at her university in California, she's doing her research on how to make the layovers experience better. That's her study. What? And she reached out to us because she was probably looking for who talks about layovers. And obviously, the name of our podcast is Layovers. And uh, I had a call with her that was awesome. I would have never expected that somebody would reach out to us to talk about how to make a layover better. But it was awesome. So... Shout out to Kat. Then uh, we have a, a new saga, Alex. Uh-oh. This Bombardier Divider. Oh, yeah. I, it's funny. I was just thinking about that the other day. Yes, it's getting... The saga is the right word. <laughs> so we had uh, Jacob. Jacob, I don't know how I pronounced your name correctly. 
who first mentioned this story about how Bombardier didn't know how to do the proper types of dividers. And then we had Jean-Francois, who came back, who was working for Bombardier for years, tell us, no, they know how to do it. And now Jacob responded, don't fight, guys. That uh, <laughs> He says that Bombardier can make dividers, but these dividers they make, they don't move after every flight, which is the case for a lot of European-based airlines. You know, they move them backwards and up, depending on how big the business class would be. And because the Series C or the A220, like we say now, the bins are unique. They have a very different shape than usual. They're huge. They're not the same on the right wing or on the left wing. That is not exactly the same design at what corporate jets would have done for Bombardier. And his source about this is actually the manager of the C-Series interior products. Okay. That's pretty solid, which could tell that they didn't know at first. They might know now, but they might not actually have had, uh, tested the product or actually have the proper approval. We don't know more than that, but yeah. So yeah, <laughs> guys, don't fight. I'm sure you're both right in a certain way, but yeah, it's interesting to see that a simple divider is so complex. You'd think that it would be just very easy to do, but it's not. I wonder if it was one of those things where they had come up with this asymmetric overhead bin design and, and it was a solution to probably another complicated problem and they were really pleased about it. And then someone around the, the water cooler at the coffee machine said, how do we move the cabin divider? And there was <laughs> lots of profanity. And I don't know. I think it's fascinating that they... and the. I did a couple of short haul European flights, quite a few in the last two weeks, and and seeing how big or small the whatever you want to call it the the original business class cabin was for those particular flights is really interesting. Like maybe three rows in one way, but ten rows on yeah. another leg. They have to be flexible, which I always think is interesting when you compare it to the inside of the U.S. regional carriers, where there is a different seat completely. Yeah. Uh, same with Japan as well, but they're using predominantly wide bodies. And I wonder I wonder if there's a middle ground or, or, or who's right, if you will. I don't know, maybe, maybe no one's right, but I certainly appreciate the American style and the Japanese style, basically everywhere outside of Europe style of this. <laughs> yeah, actual... I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, it's still okay, but yeah, it's true that when we compare that to whatever we get elsewhere, it's sometimes a bit frustrating. The same, uh, Jakob told us that he was about to embark on a Zurich to Beijing flight uh, on Swiss Air. On oh, sorry, on Swiss Air, on Swiss, and they had accepted his bid for a first class. So I'm very jealous. We are very jealous, and we hope that Jakob, you tell us about all this because that must be one of the best products in the air. Yeah, yeah, it looks fantastic. I keep uh, I keep eyeing the Swiss flights out of the corner of my eye whenever I have to go anywhere, but. <laughs> they are quite expensive, aren't they? They're not the most competitively priced, the Swiss, especially yes, in premium. On, yeah, on long haul, yes. Uh, on long haul, especially. In, in short haul, they, they are very competitive to go to Switzerland, but the more competitive BA, for instance. And sometimes they're even on economy, economy light, as they call it. They're on par with EasyJet, for instance. So it actually wow. is valid. Uh, I'm going to fly to Geneva probably in two days, but I can only know if I'm going to go tomorrow. So it will be a last minute to buy and to Today, the economy light, because I'm not going to travel with anything, are still at the same price as EasyJet. So why not? You know, yeah, have absolutely. the miles. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Jean-Francois, so the, the person from Bombardier, mentioned something. I think I had mentioned it episodes and episodes ago, but I wanted to repeat that for people who are puzzled. Yes, my first language is French. That's why I speak and I use all the French word. Like I, when I say Air France, I say it with a French <laughs> accent. <laughs> so guys, I could do this entire podcast in French, but I won't lose all our audience. And uh, a lot of it is, of course, English speaking. Merci à tous qui parlent français. And you would um, have to speak very, very slowly for me to understand you as well. So the podcast <laughs> yeah, would be six hours long. <laughs> your, your, your French is pretty good. It's it's okay. It's okay. No, I, can, I can I can make a fool of myself in France, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that because you flew Air France for the first time. It's going to come up in a few, guys. I'm very curious to see what you thought about them. Um, Daniel Kevan at Dan Kevan Legal on Twitter said that he's listened to older episodes, like probably everybody does. I can also see the stats that older episodes are lifting up. So thank you for going back to our dire days when our sound was not great and we didn't have that dynamic uh, and he said that uh, he's pretty sure that he had a decent pizza in the Qantas lounge in Narita again uh, Qantas yeah the, uh, that's I think that's so interesting I'm gonna have okay so there we go next time you or I are in T3 
we have to go to the, and Heathrow, go to the Qantas Lounge and A, try it out, B, try the food and see if they have pizza. Because it's <laughs> only been either Antipodean airports or airlines. So right. let's let's see. <laughs> he adds on another tweet he sent me that is from Melbourne. He used to live in London for 10 years and now he's based on the Gold Coast. The airport is OOL. Which one is that? Gold Coast Airport? I don't know. Ooh, uh, yeah, I think it is. And he works in Brisbane. And when he was listening to the Melbourne episode, so that's a few episodes ago, and that I was talking about the lack of rail link that he finds also terrible, he says that the best option is Uber, but there's also something called the Skybus, which links you from the airport to the center of Melbourne. So I didn't say that. I didn't try it. I didn't even know it existed because I always default to Uber when there's nothing else. So And I hope we mentioned that in the attaché book. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, guys. If Oh, yeah, actually, I, I have it behind me. I should maybe check it out during this <laughs> recording. <laughs> because actually, I, I bought uh, several of your books, as you know, and I'm packaging because I'm offering them to clients, actually. That's cool. Thank you. No, of course. My pleasure, man. Uh, not the one that you signed for me, obviously, because that's a, that's a prized uh, possession. I will never <laughs> let it go. <laughs> if my house ever burns, that's the first thing I'll uh, <laughs> run out with after my cat. After your cat. <laughs> <laughs> and then what? Yeah, so we had a Joe on Twitter, a 907 Joe, also talks about pizza and says that in the Korean Air Prestige Lounge East at Incheon, there is also pizza. And I love the hashtag he uses, hashtag the great pizza lounge search. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's, it's very important work that we're doing here. <laughs> Indeed. On Facebook, uh, Steaming Mungo Ned, who's been a loyal uh, listener, tells us that our last episode was another thoroughly enjoyable show. He really appreciates the time and effort that we both uh, put in them. So thank you. We really do appreciate that kind of comments. That yeah, keeps, us, keeps us going. Ryan Banks on Twitter, rbanks03, talking about your airport, Alex, YVR, so Vancouver. Uh, yes. uh, he says that Vancouver is one of his favorite airports. <laughs> he would love to hear our opinions on uh, YYZ, as it has always mixed reviews. I mean, we need to go there, obviously, but he volunteers to give also feedback because he loves the Canadian content that we discussed so yeah we need to go back more to canada in 2019 to actually cover it's these. funny I, i've i've been to toronto but i've never actually been through yyz i've always gone through the smaller airport whose name escapes me that's uh, on a little island there oh uh, billy bishop toronto is their london city because uh, i always go up from on porter and that's a great little airport but i've heard I've heard mixed things about YYZ. And people, actually, it's the number one requested city for us to cover uh, on Attaché. Oh, so I've never we'll, been we'll get up there. Well, there you go. We'll get up there. But you just gave me like another airport to add to our list. I didn't know that you would have been to that other airport there. So there you go. That's another airport. Yeah, that's a up. great little airport. <laughs> See, we always have these airports that we forgot we've ever done. And then, we, oh, there's yeah. we, we never have to do any airport twice. We can go like 150 episodes probably without having to repeat a, an airport. Then we have, uh, so I had put, so I'm very sorry, guys. I always keep promising that I'm going to feature all these pictures that you guys send us of you listening to our podcast in flight and I've been traveling I've done you know the last 10 days I've done four cities I've been non-stop in flights so no time to actually update anything on Instagram or elsewhere but I'd put just before I flew I'd put uh, uh, pictures from Daryl Smith who was flying over New Zealand with Air New Zealand awesome pictures thank you so much Daryl yeah. and Sherry Burgess Burgess I'm not sure how to pronounce again please uh, forgive me says uh, very proud Air New Zealander here and seeing my favorite podcast being listened to over my favorite town. So the, yeah, well, there you go. We serve you guys. We, you serve each other now. You can you can compete about which pictures we need to put. And he, he adds that he's actually an Aussie based uh, in Sydney working for Air New Zealand as a BDM. So I mean, again, we have professional listen to us. We really love that. Yeah, and he says that he would love us to come to Sydney. Yes, we will do Sydney at some point. We promise you that. That's also a city, by the way, that you should do for attaché man yeah even though i have to think you should do 
I mean, you would have something about Melbourne because of the coffee culture. And the, I mean, I mean, both are great. So, I mean, I haven't been to Sydney in 25 years. So I haven't been to the airport of Sydney in 25 years. So I'm going to try coming up uh, next year if I can find a, a good deal and a reason to go there as well, because the good deal is not enough by itself, right? Oh, yeah, you do need for, it's quite a long way. So you need to, you do need to have a, uh, a, a another motivation or reason or excuse. <laughs> and he finally adds that he loves a podcast and that he listens to them in his car whilst driving around Sydney on my sales calls. So I'm sure that your customers will be very happy to hear our voices in the background when you, you try to sell them uh, yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> Another, and that's my friend Eric, who lives in the Republic Democratic of Congo. Oh, yeah. Always his awesome pictures. It's amazing stuff. <laughs> he actually gave us a review on uh, on Facebook. Uh, he was listening to uh, layovers on a humanitarian flight, obviously. Uh, and he says, there's nothing like listening to Alex and Paul speaking about lounges, first class, IFEs, and food on board. Whilst on a United Nations Dash 8, taking off from and landing on beaten airstrips in Northern Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> Great job, guys. Keep on entertaining us. And that was a flight. He put a picture with the Dash 8 safety leaflet and some other brochures in a flight from Kinshasa to, I'm sure I'm going to F it up, the name of that airport, Gbadolite Airport, which is, I think, in the north of the Republic Democratic of Congo. Eric, I'm going to see you next year. I'm going to come to Congo. I need to see that. He really does fly. have the most extraordinary experiences. Yeah, he will, he will come on the show. I, I've told him you have to come on the show because not only now he lives there, but he has lived in countries, you know, Liberia. He's been in, he was in Afghanistan during 9-11, man, that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, I mean, when the towers fell, I remember because I called him to tell him about the towers and my bill back in 2001 because I was calling him on an Inmarsat phone. My bill uh, cost me a thousand dollars. Holy crap! <laughs> but man, I mean, I, I had to share that with you. I, I remember telling him the towers are falling. It was like, what? The towers? You know, there, there was an information ban back then in Afghanistan. I mean, he'll tell the story better than me because now my, my memory is blurry. That's the name of the episode, blurry. Right. Everything is blurs back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, since we're on Instagram, not re directly related to a feedback, but on the Swiss, Fly Swiss, at Fly Swiss Instagram, there's a fantastic series currently by someone named Dave underscore Highfly. He's an aircraft engineer at Swiss Technics, so he does maintenance for Swiss and Edelweiss. And he took over the Instagram account and, you know, he has GoPros and, uh, and all these, you know, super cool cameras and he documents everything that happens in hangars, in the backgrounds, your maintenance for Swiss and Edelweiss, and that is wow. amazing, amazing like content. Yeah, and I and I commend Swiss, and I wish other airlines would like give out their. I mean, I'm sure they do, by the way. The but give out their. Yeah, yeah, because it's super cool. You know, there, there's this one shot. He clearly put the the GoPro on one of these massive doors. You know, that open to let the plane in into the hangar, and he did a time lapse of the the, the door opening, the plane coming in, and the door closing. And you're like, this is so so massive. It's it's incredible. By the way, have you seen, since we're talking about angers, have you seen that uh, everybody shared that with us, that uh, Munich Airport A A380 door they did? Yes, it's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. In fact, my my father was working in, at Munich Airport recently for several weeks and said that it really is such a world-class airport. And they are, they've got a long-term strategic plan and that they're really putting the I don't know, whatever you want to, whatever analogy or metaphor you want to use, but they're putting it into practice incrementally so that it does start to feel truly world-class up there with the likes of, of Hong Kong and Changi as well. So kudos to them. They're really, really taking it to the next level and they're leaving Frankfurt in their dust. Yeah, I, I was I was punishing myself. I've done Frankfurt five times in the last week. Oh, and five times it was a disaster. I'll come to that later in the show if we have time, otherwise in the next one. Uh, yeah, and we said that, I think, when we were talking about how a disaster Frankfurt was. The, the contrast with Munich, which is with Zurich, my favorite airport in Europe, because you can literally lay over in five minutes and everything works. And the layout, even if it's your first time, it's super so clear. You, 
you know where to go. At least in the terminal from Lufthansa, yep. I really don't know the the other terminal, which is a non Lufthansa terminal, which I've only used once. But it's it's a breeze, and you compare that to Frankfurt, which I literally had a bus every single time. Uh, I, I had to run. If you're not an able person and you don't know your surroundings, as in you know a little bit how Frankfurt works, there's no way to make the connection. I would have lost two planes, and I just ran like a madman in the airport, and I'd barely, barely made it twice. It, I was the it last wasn't one always order. like that, was it? I remember no. even five years ago, it was pretty good. I do agree, actually. When you say that, yes, actually, yeah, you're right. I don't know if it's they've increased security or they just uh, had to manage the layout. I don't know what's happening, but it's just a disaster. They need to, to up their game because they're being left behind, even by the likes of... Amsterdam or even even Paris, which you'll go about in a few as well. Even Paris nowadays, I would say it's better than Frankfurt, yeah. uh, which is a big thing to say for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Another picture in picture we received, Yannick Paganini on Instagram, Paga91. Again, awesome because he works at Swiss and he sent us a picture of listening to our podcast from the crew bunk in a 777 and he was flying from Zurich to San Francisco. So he was like on his crew rest in the bunk and was listening to us man that's so great i mean thank you so much for doing that if especially you guys that work in the industry and that actually make our flights so much better thank you so much for doing what you do because otherwise we wouldn't be able to be so enthusiastic about air travel uh yannick adds and thank you so much that we both have an awesome dynamic and he's always looking forward to new episodes he also <laughs> He also was, it was really nice of, of, of him, but he also was disappointed that you remember when I took that flight from Hong Kong back to Zurich and I was not recognized as a senator customer, which to me was, I was not complaining about the fact that I wasn't, I was just wanting not to have to add my miles after the flight. Yeah, that's a little, always a little bit of a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah, so I just want to say, uh, Swiss, you always do a great job with me and I was not in any way or form mad that not being recognized I really don't need that I just didn't want to have because we travel so much that if I have to remember that oh I need to add my miles and I'm gonna forget about it I'm yeah. sure so that's that was the only reason so thank you so much Yannick so now we're gonna go to your flight uh, the Air France to Etihad but first this ad by Etihad that I ran yesterday on December 3rd it was yes. the uh, UAE National Day so it's an ad about Etihad and the tagline of the ad is United we are strong so not not united the airline but united together and literally more than two-thirds of the footage about an etihad ad is footage from emirates and a little bit from fly dubai and you're like the writing is on the wall come on i mean i get it it's one single country but you have etihad doing an advertising about emirates yeah what does that mean yeah i mean um it doesn't get much more obvious than that that there's <laughs> there's some and perhaps not a full acquisition but maybe a much much tighter integration of those two slash three airlines yeah uh, absolutely and, and i you know i i said this to you yesterday in reaction to the story that if they do become one entity like an iag that's a formidable entity there's i agree three well two and a half very very strong airlines there with as we've talked about ad nauseum a geographically perfect hub that's yeah. going to be hard to beat. So I think, yeah. uh, I, you know, this has always been an option f for a long time. Uh, and I think and now we're starting to see it come to life. I think so, too. I mean, we'll see. Uh, we're not making the predictions, but I'm pretty sure the writing is on the wall already. Yeah. There's no other way out for Etihad. I mean, we'll talk about that exactly in a minute. So let's start because it was Air France. We were both in the airport. We both had a <laughs> flight at 6 a.m. I was at T2, departing with uh, Swiss, actually, towards Belgrade uh, via Zurich. And you were departing to your trip to Abu Dhabi. But you first had an Air France flight to Paris to catch your next flight. I'll let you tell the story. And it was fun because we were like, who's going to depart first? And I was already tagged seeing whilst you were still boarding so for once I, I, I beat you on the runway but I know <laughs> that usually the, the Swiss flight that 6am flight that I very often take is usually the first one to leave I don't know why uh, I don't know if it's just an agreement if it's just they're very efficient about boarding and we both had the experience upon landing you in Paris and me in Zurich of super heavy fog so I'll let you go for how was T4 how was because you hadn't been there for a while actually and how was maybe the lounge and how was Air France 
France. Yeah, it was um, like I say a very early flight, and it was the first time I've been on Air France since I was a teenager. So I have no recollection of what it was like back then. So again, I was eyes wide open for for that experience. But I hadn't been back to T4, I don't think, since I proposed to my wife. <laughs> wow, which was wow. Uh, nearly 19 years ago. So. Yeah, it was quite quite nice going there. I, I stayed at the hotel in inside the terminal in one of their weird little cabins, which is which is fine. I think it's a neat little product, and it's so cheap. So if you got an early morning flight, that's that's the way to go. I've done the one in uh, the T four. Actually, I was the day I always remember. It was a day that Kate and what's her name? Oh, Prince William. Yeah, yeah, it got married, and I was on a. 12 hour layover going to South, I was not living in the UK, going to South uh, America. And because it was, everybody said the, the center of London was so backed up. That I said, you know what? I'm just going to stay in the hotel and watch from there. It was a very nice little it's hotel, a good way of actually. Doing it. Yeah, it is a nice. And there are these little cabins with the. the very Japanese. Very right? Japanese. Yeah, I think that's where the inspiration came from, was the, the capsule hotels in, in Japan. Uh, so that's fine. And then the Air France Lounge. In, uh, yes, it's it's fine. Uh, it's it's two story. It's it, you know it's it's a nice lounge. It, um, but it was no one really wanted to be there at uh, whatever it was <laughs> five thirty in the morning, and you could tell. So I didn't spend much much time in there. The one thing I discovered about T four, and I don't know if this is new. If you're a regular through T four, let me know. By gate sixteen, there is an observation deck. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, it's indoor, but it is upstairs, and you do get a really good view of the airport. I had no idea that that existed. So if you're anywhere near, I mean, it's not exactly the, the world's biggest terminal. So no, it's very tight. That's why I don't think they have lots of room to actually build those lounges there. I mean, for Air France, you can say that you know Air France basically flies to Paris from there, so they don't really need a huge lounge. No. I guess, and it's a shared lounge. Uh, so, well, it's. I think it's their lounge. It's a Star Alliance lounge. No, I mean, a uh, Sky Team uh, lounge. It's theirs. This one is theirs. I mean, it's it's clearly, because I've been to other Air France lounges as well, you can clearly see the mark of Air France, at least the old one, because now they're refurbishing the one in Paris as well. But it's it, it has been influenced or created by Air France, and of course it's shared with, with Sky Team. But yeah, it's theirs. Yeah, it was it was. It was fine. But as you say, uh, the, we sat on the ground once we boarded our, our A319. We sat there for, I don't know, I don't know, a good 45 minutes after our pushback time because we were being held due to this extraordinary fog in Paris. But I think the the first thing I sent you when I got on board was, and I was in business class, I'm never complaining about BA short haul business class legroom again because it was very tight. <laughs> very tight. <laughs> it is. It is. And they block the, the seat next to you as most European carriers do on short haul. But yeah, I was like, no, I'm... I'm This is this is very tight, and I'm nowhere near as tall as you are, so I can't imagine how you would fit. No matter where you are, unless you're an emergency exit to bulkhead, no way. Yeah. So the physical product on Air France short haul, oh, and actually it was a yeah, it was a three eight three nineteen, wasn't great, but and you did say this, and you did not warn me, but you you did say make sure that you get the food because on both of my short haul legs, damn that food was good. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like the bread was. Uh, It just Real shows bread. how half-assed everybody else does it, and you know you'd hope that that a French airline would would do bread better than anybody else. But oh my gosh, the food was so good, and it wasn't complicated or I don't know, it wasn't even hot, but it was so elegant and so tasty and so well done. You you were absolutely right. It was bang I'm on. I'm a big fan. I'm a big 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 fan. Um, and wait until you try one day the. The long haul food as well. I, I'm sure it has changed. I haven't flown them long haul in a while, but that's what I used when I was living in Japan. And every time I was stepping into the plane in Narita and I was going back to Europe, I'm like, the food. And the food yeah. never failed. Never failed me. I was so impressed by it. But I did, since we did push back late, I had a 90 minute layover in Charles de Gaulle to get from my Air France flight to my Etihad flight. Sorry, before you go there, sorry to interrupt you, because we, let's talk just a minute about the fog, because we had both the same experience. We were asked 
directly by the pilot myself, probably you as well, to not simply put our devices in flight mode, yes. but to completely shut them down. And apparently that was linked to fog. I was surprised because they insisted on it. Please shut all your devices down. Do not yes. put them in flight they, mode. They, the pilot came on three times and said, please, please turn it off. And he didn't... They actually said, because uh, the, the flight attendant said it first, and they said, due to security reasons. And I was like, well, nobody's going to believe that. You should really yeah. <laughs> explain. You should explain the real reason, maybe not without freaking everybody out. But when we landed at Charles de Gaulle, I reckon we were 20 feet off the runway before I could see the ground. It was pea soup. And yeah. I was curious, so I looked it up and... When you do the precision instrument approach on an ILS with with minimum, with basically no visibility, there is the possibility for electronic devices to generate interference. And the ILS, especially on that, is, is sensitive. So when you are coming down to 20 feet, as opposed to 400, 500, 600 feet, you want to make damn sure that every single reading that you're getting on the flight deck is as accurate as you can. So there was a great a explanation of this on on Stack on the aviation kind of sub forum on Stack Exchange. Exchange, that explains yeah. All of the the frequencies and how they can be caused by the interference can be caused by devices that we have on us. So I was really interested in that, but I've never ever ever landed in fog as thick as that. Anywhere. Probably the fog in Zurich was not as thick because I had slightly more visibility, but I had the same warning and it was the first time, and we do fly a lot, that I got like this stern message from the pilot and not from the, the crew, please turn off your devices several times. And it was like, okay, wow. They didn't explain either, and it was on Swiss, why? That's why we kind of exchanged each other. Like, why? Did you have that? Oh, yeah, you had that too. Yeah. What is it? Very interesting. Guys, if you ever had that or if you're a pilot and uh, you want to tell us about the regulation behind it, besides that article on aviation.stackexchange.com, please uh, come forward. And before, again, you go to your layover, you had sent me, in a, because I kept it because I found it super funny, the safety leaflet yeah. of that uh, oh, Airbus that, 319. Yeah. So <laughs> it's funny, There's just, it's, a, it's a tiny little um, safety card, but on the front of it, it, <laughs> it has uh, these six circles with things crossed out uh, and actually one not crossed out. You can't use your phone. You can use Bluetooth, which is interesting because you have run into situations where... Yeah, Lufthansa, can, they would tell me no. Yeah. yeah, for your headphones and things like that. Don't use Wi-Fi. And I think these other two mean don't smoke and don't vape. One is don't smoke and don't vape. And the other one is don't smoke and don't vape in the lavatory. In the lavatories. And don't charge your vape pen vape. using the power outlets in French the French do smoke, right? <laughs> but the, my favorite one is yeah. don't lie on the floor. <laughs> And it's just an illustration in typical safety card illustration style of this dude lying on the floor. It's, it's such it's, a big it's... problem, apparently, that it needs front page <laughs> coverage on the on the the safety card. I thought that was pretty funny. But so the, anyway, uh, you you you're landing, and uh, we know because we discussed about Charles de Gaulle when we actually finally did the episode that uh, layovering in Charles de Gaulle is not always the funniest bit. You did actually receive a card for that. I as did. Well. That's the hilarious thing. It, it's. There were a lot of people with connections, and the flight attendant, funnily enough, she was French-American or American-French, so we had a long conversation because she had a friend in a town one over from where I grew up. And I said, look, it's getting kind of tight. Do you have any tips for how to get over? And she said, well, hold on a second. And she comes back with this stack of these leaflets that explain if you were arriving in this terminal, here are all the options to get to the other terminal and to the TGV and to Orly. Here are all the steps. Here's how long it's going to take for every guys, combination. Guys, the matrix, and that's only for 2E and 2F and 2G. So they could be others, but the matrix is like five terminals and each of them has nine options. Yeah. And you have to find what kind of layover you need to do. I mean, if they need to show that to you, it means that it's really not clear how yeah. to do that, right? And I was not excited about this at all because I, I was looking at the clock going, this is going to be... This is going to be tight, and uh, they they actually pre-warn you on this matrix is the perfect word for it, that you are going to have to go through security as well. So I kind of pre-prepared myself. But actually, in Charles de Gaulle's defense, the airport, not the general, it was actually <laughs> fine. I got off my plane. I went through security. I found the bus very easily. I was okay. fortunate enough to be 
going the right way around the loop yeah. on the bus. Yeah. It goes only one direction. I think it it's goes clockwise. Yeah. Or anti, I don't remember. But I the thing is, if either. sometimes if you are in the next terminal, but it happens to be anti-clockwise and you go for clockwise, you have to do the all round before reaching it 45 minutes in a bus. Yeah. Uh, so it's not always, but okay, you were lucky. Good. I, I was lucky. And I, and I well, it's funny because I got off the bus and I went up to terminal 2C, which is where Etihad go out of. And I walked right up to the check-in gates or to the boarding gates. There was not a soul there, passenger-wise. Oh. It was fully oh. manned and walked straight onto the airplane as if I was one of the last people to board. And I sent you a message going, crap, I think I was one of the last people to board. I was not. Quite a few people boarded after me for the exact same reason as there were a lot of misconnections. And there was enough of a, of a transfer percentage of the of the total passengers for the flight where they just said look you know, we're going to be delayed we have a short flight down to abu dhabi let's just hold it but it did fill up reasonably over the next maybe 45 minutes but yeah oh, wow. so okay and the same thing happened on the way back although i had much 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 longer time but i feared charles de gaulle but i don't anymore although now <laughs> i've said that i'm gonna have a terrible experience next time i have to go <laughs> So how was it you had then? When I got on board, I was impressed by the physical product. The 380, right? It was a 380 upper deck. And to get to my seat from where the door was, I had to walk through the lounge, which is very, very impressive. This sort of business class, first class lounge that they have. It's unlike Emirates, you have it at the back of the top deck. And it's it's nice. This felt much more land-based, if you know what I mean. It didn't feel like you were on an airplane. It felt like you were in a small hotel lounge. And you had all of the amenities next to you. You had had a bar and and not as many snacks or anything like that out as as Emirates do or even BA or American Airlines. But it did look very comfortable. The physical seat is, and I think we talked about this either last episode or the previous episode, physically the seat is the same structure as, as... the Q suite and uh, yep and yep. A and A no that's Emirates no that's Emirates yeah you know. um, but it's 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 a very secluded were you on the pure window or fake ale you know like they are nowadays so one is as a console on the right so on the ale and one as the console on the window my my you? screen was up against the window so I had the the kind of barrier between me and, the, and the aisle yeah so it's it felt a bit more private and you you have a big old screen and you've got the removable almost like the little playstation handheld screen yeah. uh where you can where you can have the map and the and the uh, one of the cameras they have three cameras much like emirates uh if you if you like it you can control all your all your bits and pieces and have live tv and then as you've mentioned in the past you've got that third fixed screen which is used for all of your seat controls and I think lighting and calling the cabin crew. And, and do not disturb as well. Do not yeah. disturb and all of that there. It was there as well. So the massage function in the seat and all of that. Mine did not have the door, but it's got that beautiful light. Uh, yeah, which is, that's amazing. It, and it's such a stupid little yeah, to- tiny thing. Yeah. But it makes such a difference. It doesn't exactly. feel like an airplane seat. Remember, that's exactly what I said when I did the, the flight to Melbourne. I said, that light makes a huge difference in the character of the seat. It's just a light. And he has that, guys, for context, he has that same type of um, design that the tail, the new tail on Etihad has, which is his mosaic type. And he, it's just a light, but it gives a huge difference in terms of, again, the character of this whole th- seat. I find it brilliant in terms of design. Yeah, it, I, I did too. And the, the whole thing was really impressive to me the table was also very big the right? table's big and it comes out it's 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 quite an unusual design because it's stored yep. vertically yep. and it, it comes down from the bit that faces the aisle in my case and and sl- yeah, the side of the screen basically. yeah, yeah. And, it, and comes down and then you you flatten it towards you the only thing that frustrated me a little bit was that and i was in row i don't know 15 or 16 i think and by the time I'd ordered my food, they'd run out of the mains. Oh, wow. That never happened to me, actually. So I didn't, on, I didn't wow. get a chance. I had to have what was left. And it was fine, but it wasn't what I wanted. Oh, wow. Uh, it never happened to me either. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. Okay. That's because I flew also the 380 to the one that I flew to Abu Dhabi, then to go to Karachi. And it's the same product as the, as the, the Dreamliner, the one I flew to Australia. And I never, I mean, of course, the Dreamliner is smaller. 
but I never had that issue. It's sometimes I was also more at the back. Wow. Yeah, okay, well, I, that I, happens. I was surprised. I mean, the the service was was fine and just the the level of kind of deferential and polite, but also conversational and human and friendly. I think they did a good job with that. Yep. As we've talked about on the Middle Eastern carriers who have scaled quickly, that can be hit and miss. But yeah, I thought it was good. Uh, they have Wi-Fi. The IFE is very good in terms of its UX and its breadth of content yep. and yep. Uh, and all of that. So you really can't fault that. I just found the Wi-Fi is now a bit expensive yes, uh, for it what was, it is. Yeah, it, it was expensive. And I, I think I used it because... There was a reason was a I needed to be on. It was a day flight. I think flight. it was a day flight. Yeah, yeah, you were not sleeping anyway or something. Yeah. So, no, because the flight ended at about half past seven or eight o'clock, maybe by the time we actually got there with a delayed departure into Abu Dhabi. I don't remember which flight because, again, I'm blurring, but on one of my Etihad flight, I took a screenshot of the offering of the Wi Fi and it was. 30 US dollars for 30 megabytes, which is very That's, low, 30 yeah. megabytes. And I mean, we, we know that they've done that because they have financial difficulties. So they, you know, they reduce all the service, remove the chauffeur service that they used to have like Emirates. Now they still have it, but only in Abu Dhabi. They've also removed a lot of the other options and amenities. It's still a very good product. I don't misquote me comparatively to a lot of other carriers that are not Middle Eastern, but they're suffering a bit from that financial situation. You can see that they, 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 they kind of went a little bit back because they need to cut costs somewhere, I guess. So yeah. Wi-Fi is one of the uh, sad uh, side effects. It was not as good as, as Emirates or or some of the other places as well. Although um, mine was 20 US dollars from Paris to Abu Dhabi. And that was, I can't remember what, but it was, it was more than enough for that flight. That's always also something that I find very striking is that sometimes on similar or on similar on the same airline, depending on the aircraft, they clearly have a different provider, yes. and a different provider has a different sets of pricing. So I can't recall. To be fair, I can't recall where I took that screenshot. Was it on the A320? Was it on the 320? I went to Karachi, or was it even like maybe back in when I was in, in Australia? But yeah, it, it's, it's striking. It's not the first time it happened to me. In other airlines, sometimes they're like, oh yeah, I will be paying this. And then I go, oh no, that's a different pricing. Why? And good for you then. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't too bad. But yes, I was impressed with with Etienne. I can't put my finger on it. There was something missing from the experience. And I think maybe it wasn't some, an individual thing, but little things that had been taken away due to the, the cost cutting that you mentioned. Like the amenity kit was good. It was Aqua de Parma. It had a beautiful bag. But not, my, yeah, there you go. That Paul's holding one up right now. It's that. But it doesn't have a whole lot in it. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. in terms of content, yep. it's, it's other than the Aqua de Parma, uh, sample of their aftershave Products, or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. Remember, I said when I flew to Australia, I said that the pursuer that day told me they still have the old one that I'm also holding in my hand, which has a more like a mosaic type of uh, design. And that was done in partnership with Lux, you know, these mini guides. Yes. And this one was very, very complete. And he, he told me that, yeah, we're moving to Aqua de Parma and I got one in mustard color and the other one black. And it's true that they look nice, the bag itself, but inside they reduced at least by 30, 40% what's inside to the point of, again, the discussion we've been having so many episodes is it still useful <laughs> yeah yeah it wasn't it wasn't particularly useful and they didn't have anything in the in the restrooms either that you could supplement the the amenity kit with so but i can't put my finger on it i don't think etihad is as good as emirates i think it's still very very good but it, it yeah. just shows how strong the emirates product is Oh, yeah. And and I think you said that in the previous episode, again, on amenity kits, we are spoiled by the quality of the amenity kits in business class by Emirates when they give yeah. you like, a, like so many things. And then, of course, anything else, again, in business class, not in first, will suffer in comparison. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. I, I uh, Emirates have set the bar very high. The cabins on Etihad feel much newer and much yeah. more refined. But uh, I think the experience on Emirates is just is just slightly better. I still find, however, and I've done, what, four times a 380? So for the same size of the flight, but there are probably less people on Etihad than on Emirates. And I, need to, I didn't go and compare the, the seat maps. 
the service is slightly more personalized on Etihad. When I say personalized, I don't mean they know you better, but because it seems sometimes on, on Emirates, I'm going to fly them probably in January, that, and I said that in the past, and you said that in the past, it has become slightly more, and I use the word industrial, because they have to do fast, they have to move fast, because there's so many people to cater for, that sometimes it feels they don't have simply the time, because they reduced, that's important, Emirates reduced the number of, of crew in a cabin, so it seems that they have less time to dedicate for you. I don't know why, but it felt that the Etihad guys had slightly more time. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe no, just I, one I, flight. I think you're probably right. I think uh, they were generally very responsive. I do agree with your assessment of the of the seat controls, that having a tactile seat button is much better than having this touchscreen LCD yeah. thing because yeah. – yeah. Sometimes it, it didn't work or didn't feel like it was doing what it was supposed to do all, all the time. But when I came back, it was a night flight and I didn't have much time to sleep. Sl- I didn't eat. I just went straight to sleep. It was the best night's sleep I've had on a plane. It was very, very comfortable as a bed. And you talked about the duvet in the last last episode or previous episode before that. It's very comfortable. They do it. They do a good job. That is a very yeah. comfortable seat. Yeah, it is very. We'll, we'll talk about the airport at the end of the show, obviously, because that's a different experience. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to add about the, the, these flights? Or no, I, I was just uh, I was impressed, and uh, I, on the way back at Paris, I I was going to go into Paris and enjoy us because I think I had about seven hours layover, and go and you know have a nice breakfast, but the uh, gilet jaune put the end oh to that. God. It just wasn't going to happen. So I actually went and I booked a pod at the Yotel in Charles de Gaulle, which is massive, absolutely huge. They've got so many of these pods and not, you can book them for four hours, which is exactly what I did and s- wow. slept like a baby for four <laughs> hours and then enjoyed that, that rather good terminal they have there. And the, the Air France lounge in, I think it was a 2E or 2F, really good food, absolutely yeah. packed, but really, really good food. So yeah, uh, a positive Charles de Gaulle experience. I would have never believed that like almost six months ago would have been, nah, never. Yeah, but nah, actually, genius. yeah. Either, or maybe we're just getting older and less, I don't know, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so for, for, to compare slightly, because basically Alex said everything and I already had mentioned, of course, my Etihad flights uh, in August when I flew to Melbourne, I'll bite that was on the Dreamliner. I also did when I went to Karachi. The, it seems like a lifetime ago and it was only three and a half weeks ago because I did fly more than 22 flights, I think, this month, um, the past month in November. So everything kind of blurs, again, that word in my mind. <laughs> so similar experience in Alex. I think that the Dreamliner version of the seat is just so slightly newer than the one on the 380, but it's very, very similar. I also felt, and I might be wrong there, that the version, and maybe people who fly Etihad can tell us the version of the 380 is slightly narrower than the one of the Dreamliner, but again, I was going to ask you that if it was narrow. It's, it's literally the same seat. Maybe it's slightly better on the Dreamliner, but we're talking marginally better. So really, the experience is very, very, very similar. And it is one of the best, if we just talk about the seat, it's one of the best seats you can have in business class in the world. You have privacy, even if you're in the center and you're with someone else, could have some privacy. Or if you, of course, if that's a person you want to be with, then you have this door that you know, slides and then you actually are together. It is, to me, probably a better seat than the one on the 380 Emirates business class, which they will refurbish. Now they have announced it. We don't know when, but they will refurbish, it's, which is also a very good seat. I mean, you know, we're talking here, when we're talking about these experiences, guys, and you know, because- It's we're, all relative. We're, we're relative. Yeah, it's all relative. So for me, I flew directly from London and not through Paris to go to uh, Abu Dhabi, which was a layover for me. It was a day that uh, Heathrow had runway lights issues. So all the oh, flights yeah. were delayed. Like delays and cancellations to the point that flights that were coming in from the US were asked not to leave the US because they couldn't ensure that they wow. would be able to land. So I was like, oh crap, will I be ever able to actually leave? <laughs> Which actually ended up happening. The funny bit is that I was going to Karachi for a Swiss passport holder like me. I can have a visa on arrival. So I had a letter of an invitation that was scanned and sent to me. I'm at the gate. I'm showing that letter of invitation. And they never had a Swiss going for the visa on arrival. And they had to call one supervisor, a second supervisor. Everybody was boarding. And I would not board. And they couldn't find what options to put. They had clearly, because I was in the back, so I could see the, the Sabre interface, where they were looking for the option for someone like me. And they were like, 
scrolling through all the options. And one of the guys, the first supervisor, was looking at the scan and says, I cannot tell if that's been doctored. As in, is it a real letter? And I'm like, my God. So I had, I had printed out, but only have a laser printer. So I printed out the, the black and white version. So I showed them on my iPad the color version that I got. And they were like like zooming in into every single stamp. Wow. Make sure. And I was like, oh, my God, they're never going to let me in. And I think at the end of the day, I just said, you know, guys, here's a credit card. If I get denied uh, Karachi, because, you know, they're responsible for that, I'm going to pay my flight back directly they were like okay whatever go in and i wasn't asked to board so you know so it happened sometimes i mean probably if i had a british passport they would have been used to it and they just never had the maybe still the that's very weird and i know that they have to take responsibility for their passengers having the correct visas but that that seems a little bit aggressive <laughs> yeah i mean you know how they are at Ether. they were kind all throughout oh, very professional good. but it was just like mm, the plane is there and everybody the pre to last person to board so me being the last one, I'd boarded maybe 10 minutes and I was still there. And I'm like, okay, they're going to close the door. And what happens? What happened? And I didn't have, you know, any luggage checked in because I never do that. So I'm like, this is even worse because at least if I have luggage checked in, they might be wanting to wait for me instead of, of you know, putting off my yeah. my, my luggage. <laughs> anyway, went in. Oh, yeah, I should. Sorry to go non chronologically. So I, I was able to experience the Etihad Lounge at T4 at Heathrow, which is not anymore the Etihad Lounge. As I said, it's a mouthful now. Now it's the the house, house, yeah, the house of Etihad and other leading airlines. Which, by the way, guys, it's the Etihad Lounge because it's the same as before. The only difference is now it's being dealt by uh, Number One, which is a very famous provider of lounges here in the UK, at least. So it's simply the same, but they allow more customers. If you're a Number One customer, you can get in. It was not fully full, and it's again the same experience probably that Air France you had. It's a bit narrow because there's no room at T4, so it's it's okay. It's really nice done very Etihad style with a lot of dark wood and light leather so it's very nice very good food I didn't want to eat because I knew that I had like this very long flight and I want to try the food so yeah so okay experience but again I'm not uptight on on the lounge experience and the rest yeah very similar than you great flights I think the most interesting is the the second flight. It was a 320 from uh, Abu Dhabi to Karachi because it's only a two hours flight. And like you mentioned earlier, we have proper business class seats, 2-2. Two, two. These large, you know, they're recliners, but they're very large. So you have like this great experience. It was really funny because next to me, there was this lady. She, she was a surgeon living in the US, but Pakistani coming back to see her family. And for two hours, she basically told me everything I need to check out, like all the oh, restaurants, the invaluable. food. That was awesome because then I did that, of course, all the Karachi. <laughs> I went to visit the markets. I went to try the food. I went like, I mean, of course, my hosts there, they were also very kind. They took me out, but I had like an awesome time in Karachi. It was, I, I'll, I'll talk about the Karachi airport in the Karachi episode and more about my experience in Karachi. But the Etihad flight was very good. And in both cases, very nice crew. I want to give a shout out to John, who was from uh, Romania on, I think it was on the return, th- 380 very uh, personalized, super nice, again, room reader, as I always tell, yeah. use the word, you know, knew exactly how to address me after like a few seconds of interaction. It was absolutely, absolutely uh, fantastic. Yeah, so the seats 2-2, you know, you have foldable screens under the armrests. So you have actually an IFE, which is pretty different from the one that you have experienced on the 380, but still with kind of good content. Again, I didn't see any because I was talking to the lady next to me about food experiences in <laughs> Pakistan. And man, the food is so good. And the food, yeah, I'll finish with the food in both, uh, both in actually the four flights with the four legs with Etihad was always very good. And what was interesting is on the flight from Karachi to Abu Dhabi, so on the way back, the options were very uh, Pakistani influenced, and that was super cool, actually. I was very happy about that. So before we go to some other flights we did, you mentioned, Alex, in one of you, and I don't know which one, one of your recent flights, that you had an incident at the gate because there were two people fighting about who should go first. What was that? Yeah, this was uh, Hamburg. It's one of those things. We talked about this a lot. It was it was the last flight of the day on the kind of back and forth between London and whatever European city. So it was very full. And the priority boarding line was three times longer than the normal people boarding <laughs> line. Without exaggeration, BA. this is on BA, which is a little bit frustrating, but it is what it is. They lump groups one, two, and three in priority boarding and everybody else in regular boarding, two lines. And I was probably 15th in the queue and 
it wasn't a queue that anybody you could be proud of. It was a couple people deep, three people deep at, at places. And they said, okay, gold card and business class passengers. And this guy started coming up through the queue. Huh. Entitled. Well, see, I, I understand that because sometimes they do group one. Fair enough. You're right. I think BA's procedures are transforming because of yes. this group. And it's a bit unfair because if you are if you stay in the lounge longer and you want to arrive last minute, you'll be at the back of the queue, but actually allowed to go first and in the plane. So you have to cut through, right? So fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and in some cases they do they, they board group one first and then group two and then group three. So this guy started walking through and I was like, whatever, you know, we're all going to the same place. We're all going to get on board. He's going to get on board eight seconds before me. So but who cares? But another guy, <laughs> old, older guy, physically grabbed him, which is a what? massive no-no anywhere, let alone wow. in an airport. You just don't touch somebody. Yeah. Grabs him like and yanks him back. This wasn't a sort of tap on the shoulder saying, excuse me, there's a cue. This was a yanked him back. And to the, the recipient of the yank, to his credit... He didn't overreact. He didn't even react negatively. He just kind of looked and, and the guy said, there's a queue here. And he's like, I know I'm in, I'm in business class. And the guy's like, well, I'm a gold card holder. And the guy said, well, yeah, I am too. And so they sort of got into this <laughs> match about like, okay, well, I've got more status than you because I'm oh in business class God. and I'm a gold card holder. And I'm a, you know, I'm a GGL, but my name, I was born in January and you were born in October. So I should go... <laughs> I should go first. And I was like, D guys, oh my we're God. literally, we're all going to the same place on the same airplane. And having observed the two people on the flight, the guy that was walking up, it was a genuine mistake. And he was, he was connecting onto a flight somewhere else through Heathrow. And he was really friendly and really nice. I saw him talking to the guy across the aisle. He was constantly joking and laughing with the fly attendant. He just seemed like a nice guy. The other yeah. guy was not. The person who yanked, he was clearly not a good person because he was also got yelled at by the fly attendants for not putting his uh, laptop away and tray table up as we were taxiing. My God. So entitlement. That's entitlement. he was very entitled, and and you know that that kind of person. They were all sociopaths. You know, there was my flight was like <laughs> I agree. The you know, I, at the end of the day, everybody's tired. I think a lot of the people on the flight were at the same conference that I was, and we just, which is funnily enough, an airport infrastructure conference. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. But you I know, couldn't I believe think, that I think behavior. These, these these cues thing, these priority things, really reveal sometimes personality types. You know, I I am the one. I'll admit, I like to be first in a plane, but it's not because I like to be first in a plane. It's just because I want to have my carry on or my bag above my seat. Yes. And I don't want to be arriving, and especially nowadays. In business class when you have let's say three rows only and you arrive and you're the last one and i always see that by the way and i saw that in all my flights recently in europe you, you see the person that you know say oh you know i'll wait until everybody's boarding to board and he's in like let's say one f yes and there's literally no more room yeah and you can see the flight attendant a bit like oh i'm sorry but you have to put your thing like above five e and maybe the guy's like yeah but i mean one and then they have to kind of play tetris with all the bags that's the only reason i really like to be first is because especially when you have a short connection i won't be able to grab my bag and leave the aircraft as quickly as I can. Yes. O otherwise, I really like you. I like you. I don't care. The one other thing for those of you, because I know we have some that never or rarely fly in business class, that even is more augmented, that kind of sense of entitlement, so sociopathy, I guess. Yeah. Because you really see behaviors that you would not see in other settings of people talking, down talking to, to crew or thinking there's some kind of superstar because you have some status. And you, man, you're just like all of us. You, yeah. you, you might have like super gold, platinum, whatever X. It doesn't matter. You just act like a human being for crying out loud. Yeah, it's crazy. It's extraordinary what happens to people's brains when they get on board of a, an airplane. And you're right. They, they talk with such... To these people who ordinarily, in any other situation, they would, they would not. I hope one would hope not talk to them yeah. like that. But I, I, it's frustrating. It's incredibly yeah. frustrating to watch. I think we had a discussion in our last episode. Is one of the reasons I don't put the tags that we receive. You know, when you get like some status, you receive like a gold tag for you carry on or. I don't want to have this display. I see so many people doing it. Some of them is just because they want to make sure that they 
luggage is considered yeah. gold or whatever. It's like it's almost like a display. I'm important. I'm like, you know what? I'm just a regular passenger. I don't need to show that I'm senator or that I'm like super VIP, whatever. I really don't need that. No. And but you see that behavior so often, and in, in the front is so so massive sometimes. Yeah. Not always. Um, you have people, good people like Alex that don't do that. Thank God. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't know about that, but certainly I think um, <laughs> there's a lot of. It only seems to happen in the premium cabins. Exactly. That's what I meant by people would never fly. You don't realize how stupid people can be and business people doing business things yeah. and feeling businessy important. Oh, yeah, goodness. It, no, it's just, uh, ugh, it's exhausting. Uh, exactly. Uh, two, then we're going to move back to other travels, but two comments we received, uh, one by Duke Schoche, or Schoche, I'm not sure, again, I'm really sorry, guys, I mispronounced all of your names, at uh, S. Shocker on Twitter. He said that regarding boarding with children, you remember we had that discussion, Alex. Yes. He says the U.S. Airlines all board families traveling with small children right after passenger needing assistance. That's pretty much the rule anywhere, I think. Uh, but he has had a bad experience with Delta. He has gold status uh, and usually he's traveled very well. He's a Delta fan. So he was traveling alone with his two and a half year old, plus, of course, carrying all our stuff. You know that you have kids, so you have you have extra stuff to carry for your kid. Yep. And he has at the gate, so he has status, flies in the front, and the gate agent asked him, where is his small child? And he says, well, right here, pointing to his daughter, and she answers, sorry, sir, we're only boarding families with small children right now. You have to wait to board with your group. <laughs> and you're like, sometimes, you know, okay, maybe the child is two and a half and not two. I don't know if she looked like older, but I mean, this is the kind of stuff, come on, he has a two and a half year old. Why would you just, re just, just reply like yeah, that? I it mean, just, it's, it's, yeah, that doesn't make uh, a lot of sense. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, since he was in first class, well, not even 30 seconds later was allowed to get in. Yeah. And uh, it's, yeah, it's sometimes you're like, just common sense, guys. You know, yeah, you that's exactly kids. what it comes down to. <laughs> just common sense. Um, and uh, David uh, Shavarian, again, not sure of your name, at Dave Shav on a Twitter Long-time listener, loves the show. He's uh, also a United defender, <laughs> but that's for another day. Yeah, well, let's not mention United in this show. Um, he was about to fly on gig to IIH. So gig is what, Rio or Sao Paulo, I don't remember now, and IIH is Houston. And a few minutes ago, after clearing security, I was walking into the immigration line, and a guy flew past me on a scooter. And he's got one of these, he sent us a picture, one of these... Carry on that oh, doubles up at a scooter. Sakes. What? I didn't even have to ask you what you think about this. <laughs> that's just a you, that's a, a accident and a lawsuit wouldn't even happen. Yeah, I, I, I you take out some it, kid and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had a, actually a good fight about scooters in general in cities. I fully agreed with you actually on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. If you want to refer to that, look at, at Alex Cube Dweller on Twitter and uh, at the back and forth about scooters in cities. We're not either of us super big fan. No. no uh, anything. By the way, so I traveled again also many times, I just told you guys, uh, all with Lufthansa, five times through Frankfurt. My God, every single time was worse than the other. The one thing I did differently than, than before is because they were all short travels, although they were all very cold. I mean, I went to Astana. Astana was minus 18. Mm. It's like, what, uh, zero Fahrenheit? I don't remember. I don't have the conversion in front of me, but I mean, it's super cold. So obviously, when you go to these kind of weather. Uh, Riga was also kind of cold. You have to pack more. So sometimes it's a, how do you pack? In summer, it's so much easier to pack stuff, right? But I bought the Peak Design travel bag, which is 45 liters, because I wanted really to say everything on my shoulder. And that was absolutely fantastic. For once, uh, I'm not going to do a bag review, but it's you should check it out. Yeah, like it looked really, really good. When you, when you told me it, I immediately Googled it and I was, it looked really good. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think I'm going to travel. I mean, I cannot do, for instance, when I go to Tokyo for eight days, that's going to be not big enough. And I'll have my carry-on. And maybe with that, actually, it's just above regulations for some airlines. I mean, it is within really? similar carry-on. But you know, because some airlines want you to have a certain height and a certain width. Uh, this, is, this is higher and narrower, whereas a carry-on can it slightly, you know, so. But I, it was funny because one of the flight attendants, she was looking at this, oh, that's a cool bag. What is it? <laughs> and I talked about and I And I said, like, I know it's just about regulations. And she looks at me and says, you know what, sir, at the end of the day, we just want them to fit in the overhead. If it fits, it's fine. Which is, again, that's common good. sense. That is good. Yeah. 
So I did uh, first London, uh, Zurich to Belgrade, Swiss. Again, Zurich, fantastic airport. Our friend Craig, Glenn Afric Craig on Twitter, he says... <laughs> Aviation nerdiness alert. I love Zurich Airport. It might be one of the most efficient airports I've ever experienced. Disembarked from an international flight, traveled across the airport, went through security, and boarded my next flight within 15 minutes. Oh, yeah, I believe I keep it. telling you guys, Zurich is fantastic. Yes. So nothing more to add there. Fantastic. Belgrade will cover it. But... The way back, I did Belgrade, Frankfurt, Zurich this time. Uh, and my uh, God, uh, 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 everything. You know, every single time I did, I did Frankfurt, as I said earlier in the episode, I had supposedly an hour or an hour and a half. But, you know, you land and then you are in a bus for about 15 minutes. I'm like, where are they driving us? Like in some weird underpasses and overpasses and some behind the scene Hollywood style. You're like, what? And you, and you, you bulged out somewhere and then... You see literally the plane where you're supposed to be, and you have to walk and walk and walk through sometimes a tunnel, sometimes not. Never, never twice I did the same in five times. And I truly really don't get it. And I'm pretty much good at finding my way in airports. And you have to go to the SkyTrain, which is super long to get to. And then it's bizarre the layout of the SkyTrain station. Then you exit. It sometimes I had to go to Schengen, sometimes not. Sometimes the security, but twice not. Three times, yes. It makes no freaking sense. And every single time the buses are what kills me because you're looking at your watch, you're like, okay, I have, once I had 20 25 minutes, man. 25 minutes. I said, I'm never going to make it. And as soon as I disembark a bus, and I'm like, okay, now it's gone. Because at least if I had the bridge, I could start running. Bus, 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 bus. Thank God my flight to London was delayed. That's why I, I caught that one. But I ran nonstop. Again, also thank God because of my uh, backpack instead of a yeah. carry-on. And I was sweaty as hell. And I arrived, and I'm like, how is someone who is not able-bodied, a bit energetic, knows a bit his way around or her way around the airport? How is it impossible? No. And I, uh, really a catastrophe. And and I, I don't know. I'm punishing myself. I'm flying through Frankfurt again on Sunday, man. I mean, I just, I just, I just, I just don't know. But anyway, uh, I mean, overall, it was fine for the first time in one of the security. There was one person, one security staff that was nice. The other ones are super rude or they don't care. This one was a nice person. I should have asked his name and commend him because for once I had like, oh, okay, wow. You know, like how when it's always bad, when someone shines, you're like, it shines even more because you're like, oh, wow, someone is actually considering me a human here at Frankfurt. That's actually... <laughs> anyway, so Lufthansa otherwise was good. Nothing to add about most of it. They were all of 320s and 321s. The interesting bit is the one I took to Astana. 3.30. So that was the actual long haul business class seat. These seats that, you know, you touch the feet of the other person. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, so it's not a bad seat, but one thing that signals that they know it's not great. So I'm sitting the first trip. I did it on the very last row. There's a small cabin with only two rows. So we were thinking row 13. Behind me was Either premium economy and economy, I forgot. Thank God there was no one next to me, uh, so no strange feet situation. It's not a bad seat, but I remember she was super cool because, you know, I'm senator. She, the head of cabin comes to greet me and thanks me, and we, and we chat, and she was super nice. And, oh, you're very tall. And I'm like, yeah, that's why it's really nice to have such a seat. And she answers, yeah, but we know it's not the best seat. So when you have someone, the head of cabin in a 330 telling you that, they know. They know it's not the best seat. They that's, know it's that, not the best seat, and they also know that you know it's not the best seat in there. That she would actually voice it? Yeah, I, well, I admire that. I admire yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, me too. For the rest, you know, it's 222. The IFE is pretty good. It's actually better than the one I had on the 747 first class that I did to, to Haneda a few months ago. It's, yeah. you know, there's enough content. Most of it works with the remote. Strangely enough, it was a different remote on each flight. The one thing that doesn't work with that seat is, you know, since you were talking about Etihad and the touchpad, the screen. Yeah. This one has regular buttons. But they placed exactly where you're going to put your your, <laughs> your, your, elbow. Your, your elbow. And thus, every time I was putting my elbow down, my seat would move. 
And I was like, oh my god, this is not what I wanted to do. So it would go like backwards or frontwards or like up and down or the massage would start. And I was like, really? The person who designed it put it at the worst place Yeah, on never the actually armrest. sat in their own seat. <laughs> yeah, because it's just tough to say. It moves every time. Other than that, Wi-Fi works really well. The 330 has no air vents. For crying out loud, I was like, come on, no air vents. But I mean, you're going to Astana, it's going to be super cold. So it's actually pretty cold in the cabin as well. So the air vents were not necessary at that point. But would I fly that to long haul? No. I, I mean, again, she says that the new city is coming in two years, probably one year, the first one, but the rollout two to three years. I would just say that if you are lucky enough to fly in business class with Lufthansa, choose the second seat I choose on the way back, which was the 1F, so first row, because since the bulkhead, the room for your feet is slightly bigger. Of course, they made it for Germans. For someone tall as me, I don't touch the ends. It was great. And this is probably the best seat. The funny thing is I, you know, I had a great time in the startup. It was very short. The people there, especially a friend, took me out. So I literally went from being out and partying with him, having drinks, to the airport. It was 3.30 a.m. I'm completely, completely tired. I passed your security. We'll cover Astana in another episode when you're going to do it as well in January. I think yes, that's right. It? Yeah, well, so we're going to. And uh, I arrive at my seat in that one F thing and I fall asleep right there. The plane was still, you know, parked and I fall asleep. And then there was no one next to me again. I'm very lucky. And the cabin was almost empty, actually. So I had my stuff there. Then I kind of opened my eyes like, oh, we're in the air. So I put my in, in lie flat and I sleep. And I literally woke up 10 minutes before we landed. Wow. And the reason I want to say here is really funny because you have that kind of very strange feeling when you say goodbye to the flight attendants, you know, when you leave the aircraft. It's as if you've never met them, actually. You never had any interaction. Yeah, it's very that's weird. True. I know exactly what you mean. You, yeah, it's like, did this mean, not mean anything to you? Exactly. Nothing. And it was like almost embarrassed. It was like, uh, well, thank you and goodbye. You know, I, I didn't have any food, nothing. I didn't touch the IFE. Really, literally just slept, like probably snored as well, because when I drink, I snore a little bit. So I'm sure they must have heard me, but they were polite enough not to tell me anything about it. Anyways, <laughs> now, I, I mean, honestly, the crew was very good, very friendly, very fun. So I'm going to give that to Lufthansa. They will have a better seat soon. And it's the 330. Not my favorite aircraft, but not bad. Have you flown 330s lately? God, I couldn't tell you last time I flew a 330. It's been a long time. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. The one thing, because you'll appreciate that, because it's food, obviously. On the way there, then I was not sleeping, because I had not been in some club before. Uh <laughs> Because it's Christmas season, they have a tradition, which, again, because I don't fly long haul with Lufthansa, or very exceptionally so, um, they have a tradition, I think it's been running for 21 years, they have goose on the menu. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's an uh, it's, uh, Asian goose that has with a bratwurst and mince meat, with a sauce with Bordeaux, and it's filled with olives and arbor eggs, a side of potatoes, bacon, a filling of marzipan and cherries, and you're like... Are they going to be able to pull it off in a flight? You know, like this Christmassy, very hearty kind of dish yeah, yeah. with cabbage and everything. Uh, and my God, it was freaking delicious. Really? It was freaking delicious. I mean, and I, I like the fact that they go for like some Christmas tradition in a flight. It's not just another, the same thing that they usually do, pasta, lasagna, and fish, right? Um, it, it, no, it's, I mean, I think it only runs until probably Christmas, maybe through the New Year's Eve. I don't know. But that Lufthansa style goose is absolutely, you would love it. Oh, yeah, it does sound it. good. It does you sound would, really good. You would absolutely, absolutely love it. Why are you going to end up flying to Astana? Are you keeping the same route you were trying? Yes. Or? Yeah, I've just moved everything. So Emirates down to Dubai and then Air Astana for the rest of it. Because the flight from Lufthansa, interestingly so, actually continues on to uh, Almaty. It stops first in Astana and continues on to Almaty. Because I was kind of hoping I would have the same crew on the way back. And I didn't. Because I forgot to say that when I think it was last episode, when I did the, my Penang uh, short stay, 
on the way back, it was, hello, Mr. Paul, oh, you're back. And uh, the, oh, the whole flight, it was the same crew. So that, that's always fun. You had that, what was it, Chicago? Yes. It's always so much fun, man. We, we Chicago have, and Norwegian, yeah. Suddenly, the, it's even more personalized because they already kind of know you and they're yeah. super fun. So. so I didn't get that sadly on Lufthansa. Maybe one day, maybe one day. Uh, and the last one was to Riga. The one thing I want to mention, because we also cover Riga in another episode, is that I did a... Went there, landed, and immediately was taken by the organizers to mentor startups in a hackathon, which was happening airside in a lounge. So that cool. was super cool, man. That was super, super cool. Riga Airport is, 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 is small, but it's is, is pretty, pretty fun. Yeah. Last comment on my flight before we move on. And I'm sure that you had that, Alex, and a lot of our listeners have that. But for some reason on Lufthansa, the layout of the seats makes it that I was in row one. Most of my flights. I think I think all all the last four I was in one A because you know they they block these seats for senators. So Some are always like super quick to to take those. And <laughs> you have one window which is next to you, and the second window is between row one and row two. Who does it belong to? Ah. Would you dare? Because, you know, I was watching my iPad and there was some light and I was, I want to close that. Yeah. But you're like, I don't want to be impolite. Maybe it belongs to the person behind you. How do you do I that? I think 95% <laughs> of people, and I and I would have been the same way. I would have, I would have just had, had to talk to the person behind me. But I think 95% of the traveling public would have just closed it. <laughs> you know? I didn't. Yeah, I said, okay, I'm just going to angle my iPad in a way that... Yeah, I no probably would have done reflection. the same thing. I would have been <laughs> horrified if I had been the other person in the window. But that's just me. I'm the same. I'm the same, Alex. So that's why we, we get along for this podcast. Because <laughs> I was like, in my head, it was like, it's bugging me. But I, I don't want to be like an ass and do that to the person behind me. Because I would hate it if it happened to me. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, and I also... <laughs> Also uh, increased my collection of 320 Neos. It seems that Lufthansa only put 320 Neos now to from London to Frankfurt. So even though I don't like Frankfurt, at least I got like pretty much all my flight to 320 Neos, which for most of the general public, they don't even see it. But I mean, I was pretty happy to have newer aircraft, actually. Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about our flights. A little bit of news before we move to the airport. First, a very fun one. You've probably seen it. I know that you're not a fan of Air Alaska. No, Alaska Airlines. Is that the right name? There was this uh, pilot on Alaska Airlines 401. I think it was a week ago, probably. He was tired of waiting in a holding pattern to land at uh, Seattle. You can see the, the route on flight radar. So he's in a pattern, 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 holding pattern. And then he went to see Mount Rainier. He yeah. came back into the, the flight pattern. It's awesome. Yeah, it, that was kind of cool. That was Because it's a, it's a stunning mountain. It really is. And you do get a wonderful view when you're when you're going in and out of seattle of that mountain that's yeah it was, what a good what a good use of time i canceled helsinki it was supposed to be there today but too many travel otherwise it would be non-stop for three weeks not in london helsinki won the best airport in northern europe and to celebrate that they made an ad which i found fantastic he went through hell to see his friends and of course hell is h-e-l yeah. the I don't know. I just like that. I do too. I do too. I'm, I'm glad that they've embraced that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we said in the last episode was supposedly to be acquired by Iceland Air, but actually Iceland Air said, no, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that they cannot do the due diligence in time? Or does it mean that actually WOW is really in a bad situation? I, 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 I think know. it's the latter. I think that they, they started the due diligence process, saw something they didn't like or lots of things they didn't like. And we're like, yeah, we're not. We're not. Nope. <laughs> it, it, it's as if these low-cost airlines in here, I don't want to point my finger to WOW, which I've never flown, only to uh, Icelander, that they are like these families that live paycheck by paycheck, have 20 credit cards and reimburse each other with the other credit card. And you're like, they literally maybe are like so close to bankruptcy, all of them. We've seen Premier Air and others. And you're like, maybe when Icelander opened the books, they're like, ah, no, there's no way. I don't know. Maybe not, actually. No, I think that's, I think that's exactly what it is. I think it's it's... Wow, are parking a lot of airplanes. I think it's all falling apart. There's a rumor that Indigo was uh, invested in uh, Spirit, Frontier, uh, Volaris, which is Mexican, JetSmart, which is from Chile, and Tiger Airways from Singapore, and also Wizz Air, uh, Hungarian uh, originally, yeah. uh, is looking into investing in Wow Air. Let's see if when they open the books, they will have the same surprises or not. That will confirm or, or not our point. Uh, in the same breath, uh, Jet Airways still running out of money. And Tata, uh, which already has, uh, I think, 
JVs with Singapore Airlines and Air Asia is looking to invest in Jet Airways. Let's see what happens when they open the books of Jet yeah, Airways. Well, exactly. <laughs> and I think that there's not only are there financial holes, but there's such some political inter mingling yeah. that they, you know, probably can't uh, or don't want to, to take either. So that'll be interesting as well. But for you, that uh, you have a connection with Virgin, although not that one, there's a very strong rumor that Virgin Atlantic wants to buy Flybe. Yeah, and I think it would probably be a, a good acquisition for them. As they, they're not a big airline, so the so the financial deficits can't be that big. So I think you know, at least at the very least, gives them some slots and maybe a feeder network. But didn't they like close like a little red years ago? They like tried already, Virgin. They they did, and that was because they acquired some slots that they needed to to use oh. for two years or something. If my memory serves me correctly, it was it was a. It wasn't an intention to grow something domestically. Uh, that's why I always thought that they should have bought Norwegian because it would have been. Yeah, a, yeah. And there were there have been a few uh, opportunities that have floated across their tables that they haven't uh, haven't jumped on for whatever reason. Obviously, they're much more in the know than I am, but it just on the face of them, they seem like good opportunities. Seems that Norwegian is kind of still up for grabs. They keep refusing all the. Certainly, they don't want IAG. <laughs> no, because IAG keeps insisting, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and talking about IAG, they are thinking of asking the Spanish government to relocate BA there, at least the uh, legal entity, because of Brexit. Yeah. I mean, I get it, because at the end of the day, the deal, I mean, we're not going to go into the old political maelstrom we're right into right now, but if there's no deal... Well, they don't have flying rights over the European Union. They need to be a European carrier. So it just makes sense to put BA in Spain. Yeah, I don't know how this would work politically, logistically, or anything in between. But it did pump up a lot that this was... I can't remember if this was speculation or if they'd already acquired the AOC or, or what the status was. But I think a lot of airlines are doing this as well, are looking into I know Ryanair. I think that was part of their Lauda... Lauda Motion. Lauda Motion, thank you. Acquisition, it was, it was a sort of their backstop. I've seen actually a load of motion for the first time, an aircraft on the ground. I don't remember where, actually. Maybe Belgrade, actually. We need to fly that Yeah, before I, I, it never. actually gets fully acquired. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Since we just talked about BA, maybe briefly, we have a few minutes. How was your BA experience to Hamburg? Yeah, it was it was fine. It's uh, it's BA, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it, it, I, you know what? Um, I have to say, we've talked about the, the food being much, much better that, uh, oh, well, actually, the, that's the, that is the one thing worth mentioning. The food in the lounge is much, much, much better than it's been as long as I can remember. In the first class lounge, which was rammed, because it always is, it was very, very, very good. So I don't know if Doe and Co have taken that over or Do and Co. Maybe. But they've certainly, because I looked into it, they now do all of the catering for every BA flight out of Heathrow and Gatwick. And it shows. It does show. It absolutely shows. So the, the lounge experience was was very strong. The boarding process was a bit weird because the flights to and from Hamburg were absolutely rammed. And they, I don't know, the again coming from japan you're just sort of like will you just get on the goddamn airplane and sit down uh <laughs> so we we, uh, we had a long taxi and and that was fine the one thing i noticed and we've talked about ba's european business class cabin service being really really good it was it was okay it was oh. okay uh, Not it wasn't bad great. it wasn't bad it wasn't bad but it just wasn't um, up to the standards that we've experienced recently and actually to their credit on the way home from Hamburg, we had after the little, you know, Tyson Fury incident. It was a very, very, very bumpy flight, and the crew had to be to be sat down for a little bit as we there was a jet stream and some crap weather in the UK from Storm Diana, maybe it was. Anyway, they managed Dirty to do a, Diana. Yeah, that's what oh, it felt like. Sorry. Oh my god, it was all, we were bouncing <laughs> all over the place, and the and the crew managed to do their service. Actually, that just reminded me of something. When we were flying from Paris to Abu Dhabi on Etihad, uh -huh. the crew were made to sit down twice, and there was not really any turbulence that I would have even expected the seatbelt sign to come on for. So they must have been reacting to aircraft maybe a few miles ahead of us, but I've never had that where 
maybe once or twice in anticipation they've they they've had the crew sit down when you when there's like a big thick line of of a jet stream yeah. crossing but yeah that was weird that was weird yeah that that is actually that is actually weird Anything else on BA? No, no. Other than that, it was fine. Hamburg Airport, very strange. We should cover that at some point. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it. It's one of these in the list for uh, guys. You, you already kind of know all the airports that we're going to cover because we keep mentioning them. So they'll come in which order? I don't know, depending yeah, on our whim. Our whim, day. exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, you just said uh, the lounge is rammed and T5 is rammed and they're adding AA. So basically, AA will now be departing from Terminal 5. How does that work? Yeah, there was this rumor that... Uh, who is it that that said it? One of the, one is it one mile at a time? Maybe. Somebody in that in that group of blogs anyway posted this. They were listening to a conference call uh, or something, a public po- conference call that AA had done, and there was a strong hint that that American would now be operating out of T five. Which, when you think about it, makes total sense because not only are they alliance partners, they are deeply invested in each other from a joint venture perspective. But the first thing I thought was, where the hell are they going to fit? Exactly. Because they operate a lot of flights, American, out of uh, London. And BA can't even fit their own flights in Terminal 5. We, Five? There's still yeah. several destinations, maybe 15, that go out of out of T3. So T3, yeah, exactly. Y- you and made also, the good point they, about T6. I mean, if, if, if they, because T6 has been a long-running plan, which should be on the other side of the road. But now it's all depending on when they actually do the third runway. And they want to do like, also like a satellite terminal next to that runway. I, I mean... No matter the, the naming, there's just no room. And you, you just mentioned the lounge at T5. Will they share the lounge? Will they open their AA Admirals Club, I think it's called, but where? There's no room. Will there's they transform no one of the, yeah. but maybe they'll transform one of the galleries lounge of BA into an AA, but then that creates, I don't know, unless, unless, and I know it's not fun to say it, unless BA start saying, you know what, maybe some people that are like bronze cannot access the lounges anymore. Like, because otherwise, I, I don't know how it was going to work. There's just no room. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how they're going to do it. I really don't know how they're going to do it. And maybe, maybe that's, it was someone talking out of turn or it was maybe, in yeah. reference to Heathrow expansion that when a new terminal opens up, that there would be a much more, uh, much tighter integration between BA and American. But I don't imagine that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Oh, and last one, millennials. We're not millennials, uh, or maybe we are in our mind. I don't know. I hate that term, man. Uh, June, June, <laughs> the millennial airline, the BS uh, airline, actually. Uh, so the new CEO of Air France KLM has arrived, uh, Ben Smith, looks at it, not even a year old, and says, you know, that kind of hybrid, which is not really a low cost, but a low cost, but a traditional airline. Basically, they wanted to reduce the cost of the the pilots are still under the Air France contracts, but the staff, the crew, is under a different contract. So that was supposedly to lower the cost. It says it doesn't work. But he wants to close it. How much money have they pissed away on this little boon? <laughs> <laughs> Where it's not really fun is not for the, uh, I think it's 700 crew. What will happen to them? Because obviously they were hired specifically for those routes. And I don't, you know, just three days ago, June introduced, I don't know if you've seen it, they introduced this uh, lifelike beds in economy. So you, you know how Sky Couch does it by Air New Zealand when you can like um, have buy two seats and sleep on them? Uh, yeah. So they did the same thing, but with a different philosophy, which I kind of like for once. I'm going to say, even though I was not a big fan of June, I mean, we've never flown them, but I didn't like whatever BS they were hiding behind millennial. No, it's just low cost. So they're adding these little padding stations in front of the seat between the seat uh, and the seat in front of you and that's only for kids for long haul flights on the 340s and it's only 18 quid on top uh, so it's really cheap and then if you have a family your kid can be uh, playing or sleeping there i found the idea pretty nice yeah actually. it was just, it was a good idea and i wonder if that's something that they'll adopt in the air france mainline product in some routes but perhaps leisure routes their equivalent of the gatwick routes whatever that is i hope so because well i mean june will stop i mean i'm not sure anybody's going to cry over that because it's really so. no one, all no the reviews long enough yeah yeah and the reviews were scathing Every, no, everybody hated it uh so i think, I think <laughs> maybe because everybody hates millennials no guys <laughs> sorry nobody hates millennials <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that was oh, a bad that was one. Good. I like by that. the way, th- by the way, did you realize on Etihad, it's very interesting. You can also, if you're an economy, you can buy your next seat free, but not at the price, of course, of a seat. It's an add-on. So it's like a, it's not premium echo, but you can make sure that the seat next to you is free for a slightly more money. Nice. Does that mean that they don't have enough people to fill their planes? Maybe, but at least it's a good idea for consumers, for passengers. I, I found nice. That's cool. So, since we are with Etihad, how was your experience of Abu Dhabi now that you've finally done it? <laughs> I don't know, already. man. I I was expecting. I don't know what I was. I was. Ex- I think I was expecting a Dubai or a Doha, yeah. and I stepped off the plane and I was like, "This is, this is kind of crappy." <laughs> It is kind of crappy. It is. It is. It's super narrow. It's, it's super tired 80s. and old it's, and it's low tacky in some parts. Yeah, I, I was. I was shocked, quite frankly. <laughs> I think because I had. I, I honestly, I was like, I can't wait to go to zero. I'm sure it's going to be super futuristic and massive and <laughs> incredible. You know, like uh, you know, in the la- Etihad Lounge, I need to make sure I get there with plenty of time. So it was all crappy. <laughs> I was really, really surprised. <laughs> it is, uh, it is, and you, you can you can now understand why I keep saying because you can see it. The new terminal which sits right there. They need to open it because this airport completely unmatches the experience you have at Etihad, which is really good. And then you arrive there and you're like, "What is going on here? Yeah. Is that a an airport from the eighties? They forgot to close or something?" It's just like very, very strange. It, it's a positive thing about it is that. Even though it's crammed with people and because all the corridors are super narrow, so you keep like elbowing everyone and you try to find yeah. your way, it doesn't make sense. Even with that, I'll admit it's still pretty fast to do a short connection. So it's not bad in the layout because you can find your way. You were departing and landing, so it's a bit different. You'll tell us in a second. But as a layover airport, if you have an hour connection, it's more than feasible because since it's not that big, and even though there's a lot of people, you'll be fine. So at least I will give it that. Yes. It's some other airport. So how was your arrival and departing situation? I mean, it was fine. I, I had uh, one of the fast track immigration passes that they give business class and first class passengers. I don't know if they go do it on every airline, but certainly on Etihad they did, and I'm very glad they did. Did you have to go through a knee gate or through a person? I had to go through a person, uh, okay. and there were two two desks and. The regular non-priority or premium, whatever you want to call it, line was long and moving very slowly. So I'm glad I did. And the immigration people were very friendly. Yeah, yeah, they are. That's Remember, I said that when when I did my stopover on the way back from Australia and I went to see the Louvre, they are... Super friendly uh, because sometimes in Dubai, in Dubai same country, they're yeah. ah. they have their they're very fierce. But I I always end up joking with the guys at Dubai. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but yeah, they they were very friendly. Went in and I had uh, someone someone meeting me, and I I was actually also surprised how far out the airport is from Abu Dhabi itself. And I had a very cool time in in Abu Dhabi. Again, it was not what I was expecting as a as a place either. It was much more. Um, Sedate, but not in a negative way compared to Dubai. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and I got to go to the to the qualifying for the Grand Prix, which was fun. Oh, my God. You're so, so jealous. Got to see the uh, UAE's um, aerial display team who were phenomenal. <laughs> really <laughs> close as well. And then Etihad did a flyby with an A380, which was kind of cool. All that kind of stuff that would never happen never in happened. many countries. Right? Nope. Because regulation, you have like yeah. a 380 over your head. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, uh, none of that was going to happen. So, yeah, we... Um, it was it was good, and then going back, like I said, I I, I got there really early because I wanted to explore the airport, and I wanted <laughs> is to, to go to the lounge and <laughs> and really take advantage of that. So they aren't good. Etihad have got dedicated business class and first class check in desks and priority security, so that was yeah. all that was all fast. very easy and fast. And yeah. then you're out There's into no a there. crappy airport. <laughs> <laughs> It's true that actually when you say that now, yeah, you're actually right. You arrive and the experience is very kind of first class E and then you belch into the airport and it goes back to the eighties and you're like, What's going on here? The 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 lounge you've experienced the lounge, the business class lounge, is not great. It's okay. It's almost I don't know if you agree with me, it almost feels like they know they have the new terminal, so they're not gonna invest a lot because it 
Yeah, Can I, fair let's enough. open the other one. But, but still, it's, it's it's the lounge is not that great either. It's usually cramped, especially in these late nights, you know, middle of the night flights, like all these uh, Middle Eastern carriers work with this, that system. It's it's okay again, but it's it feels under, underwhelming. The only one, the only lounge that I've experienced that was not the case. I mentioned it in the episode about Melbourne. Guys, listen to it. The first class lounge is much better. It's not the first class of Emirates, as in it's not as big, but at least you'll have an amazing service. But there's really a disconnect between yeah. that and the rest of the airport. Yeah, it definitely it was not impressive at all. So oh, like you say, it wasn't bad. I, we were out on time. It was all fine, but meh. <laughs> Meh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. May is the right, uh, and they're trying. I mean, you know, you have now the e gates apparently, but but they also went through a person. That's why I asked you like a minute ago. Apparently, you can with our passports go through the e gate without registration. I've been told I didn't try it. Whereas in Dubai, you need to register first. It is literally never someone at that registration desk. Because every time I land in Dubai, since I'm going often, I'm trying to register my passport. So the following time, I don't have to go through a person. And no matter when is it, when it's 8 p.m or 2 a.m. There's never anyone there. And they're always like, oh, I'm sorry, there's no one. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Anyway, and the other thing to, uh, to Abu Dhabi, you can also now board with e-gates. They've introduced them. They're not at every gate yet, but at least they are trying. But the rest, yeah, it's just, nah, it doesn't work. Yeah, and it, I, I'm very interested to see how much of a improvement this new terminal is. We'll see. Well, the images look awesome. Now the new, because it kept pushing it back, I guess, for financial reasons. The new date of opening is exactly in a year, December 2019. So let's see. Uh, the one very, very redeeming thing about that airport for me is the tower. It's still my favorite tower. It's almost like a mirage. It stays in the desert on the background of the airport. And he has the appearance. I know I've said it countless times, guys. I'm sorry to go into lyricism about this, this tower, but has this kind of appearance of a sail and again with a hue of the desert of the color of the rising or the rising sun or the sun setting it gives like a fantastic there's no better tower in the world even nothing against uh, my friends from turkey but even the one for the new istanbul airport which also is awesome done by i think norman foster i still believe the one in abu dhabi is the best tower in the world at least design wise wow there you go <laughs> <laughs> so it's December. We don't have that many flights remaining, thank God, because we both have uh, exceeded our records. Uh, and since we're not uh, entitled people that elbow each other at the gate, we're not going to mention how many flights nor how many uh, miles, because I think it's a bit sometimes a bit of a dick's game here. Yeah. Uh, so, what is what are your next uh, destinations? I just have one more flight this, well, one more trip this year, and that's to Lisbon next week on BA. I'm just in and out there for a night, and then back, and then I'm done. That's fantastic, actually. Since I wasn't, I didn't mention it. Didn't have time in the previous episode, but I've been to Lisbon, as you guys know. That's another airport we can do. Yes, surprising, yes. surprising airport as well. Look, we have so many, man. <laughs> uh, as for me, maybe as I told you guys, Geneva in two days with uh, Swiss, obviously. But then that big, big trip to Tokyo. I say big not only because it's eight days, but also because it's a mix and match of airlines. So it would be very interesting. By the way, quick story before we close the show, because I know that Alex has to run. Um, I had this, uh, an alert on my email by Lufthansa. You need to call us immediately. We tried to call you not to avail. Of course, I was traveling and I'm like, ooh, la la, what's going on? Uh, and it, uh, regarding my flight to Tokyo, and I'm like, oh my God, what's uh, going to happen? Uh, they canceled it or something. So, I was supposed to fly London to Incheon with Asiana. I paid uh, this flight parts on miles, hence Lufthansa calls me. And then I had 65 minutes to catch Ethiopian from Incheon to Narita. Ethiopian, it's, it's amazing what you can do these days. And I really wanted to do because I want to try Asiana and I can try uh, also Ethiopian. And they call me and I'm like, oh my God, first I'm going to lose that. And, and they said Ethiopian has changed its schedule, maybe winter schedule or something. And I only have 45 minutes now in Incheon uh. and they don't believe I'm going to make it. Incheon being very efficient, but they still don't believe, so they don't want to take any chances. So they rebooked me. Now I'm doing London, Frankfurt. Thank you, my God, I'm going to Frankfurt again. It's like a toxic relationship. You know, I keep saying no, and I keep going back. Uh, and <laughs> and, and uh, with Lufthansa, then I'm doing Frankfurt, 
uh, Incheon with Aziana. Sadly, not on the 350. I really wanted a 350. I'm going to be the 380. And then I'll have five hours in Incheon before catching that Ethiopian flight, uh, the Dreamliner, to Japan. But it's interesting how they were trying to insist to call me and I was like but it's, I mean it's going to be it's going to be fine three flights to go to Japan staying eight days and then when I come back I'm going to do it this time because this is a different one world I'm going to do JAL to Helsinki and then uh, uh, Dreamliner Finnair. yeah 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 and then Finnair or BA I can't recall back to London all that probably in the next episode uh, it's going to be just before Christmas we hope so we had a streak of being able to record every two weeks, which is unbelievable almost. It really uh, is unbelievable. Can we keep that up? Well, let's try in two weeks. And until then, happy travels. Safe travels, guys. <laughs>